Welcome to Raising the Flipping Bar, the go-to podcast for aspiring and seasoned real estate investors. I'm your host, Derek Marlin, and I'm the CEO of Elevation. We're a real estate investment company based right here in Denver, Colorado. We'll dive into smart investment strategies, market insights, and essential tips for scaling your real estate ventures. Whether you're making your first investment or your hundredth investment, this podcast is your blueprint for success in the ever-evolving world of real estate investing. Get ready to elevate your real estate game and begin your journey with me. Welcome back to Raising the Flipping Bar. I'm your host, Derek Marlin, and we're going to talk about the five top ways to source deals in today's current environment. So we're in 2024. Things are obviously continually changing on a year-to-year basis, but the good news is, is there's a lot of strategies to sourcing and finding good deals that are tried and true. So on this episode, we're going to talk about deal sourcing, which is obviously the lifeblood of a thriving business. You've got to have deals to be able to flip them, to wholesale them, to list them, and to earn a profit. We're also going to be talking about some of these strategies that are both on market and off market, because that's a key for us driving our business is actually doing both. And then we're also going to get into what works in expensive markets like Denver. So I think there's some strategies that people use in other less expensive, more cash flowing markets, but I think that's a bit different from what is working in more expensive markets like Denver. So let's jump right into today's episode. I want to start off with kind of two properties from a story perspective. And the common theme through these two different properties are how we source them. And honestly, it's our number one way to acquire and find great properties is referrals from other real estate agents. I have no idea why other investors, uh, some other investors, I should say, shy away from building relationships and, and doing deals with real estate agents. That is key to our success. So one of the keys to our success is obviously, like I said, working with those real estate agents and some people call them pocket listings. So what that is, is People, real estate agents, I should say, have properties. They're usually a bit beat up. There's probably some sort of distress. They're not well fixed up typically, and they uh, are not best to just be put on the market. So a great real estate agent will actually have investors in their corner and in their network that they can get offers from. The great thing about a pocket listing is whatever the commission is that the seller's real estate agent has negotiated, that's great. You should keep that. You've earned that money, whether it's doing all the work of getting something on the market or doing something off the market. So for us, it doesn't matter. You should keep and earn that commission. The great thing about the way we run our business is by me not being a licensed real estate agent, I don't have to charge a commission. And so it saves most sellers at least 50% of what they would normally pay. And in today's current market environment, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars in savings. For us, it's all just numbers. It's all just in a spreadsheet. If they're dying to pay somebody commission, we can accept that. I've got agents on our team that can accept that. But for the most part, a pocket listing is going to save your client half of that fee. So we're going to talk about two properties right now. One was on uh, a street called Manet Way. And then a second one was on 54th Avenue in Green Valley Ranch. So we've got one in Westminster, which is a northern suburb of Denver, and one in more of an eastern suburb in the city and county of Denver, but just on the east side of Metro Denver. We'll talk about Monet Way first. That one was, again, a pocket listing, and we did not earn the commission. So I think that was really beneficial to the seller. That's an easy selling point for that real estate agent. This was a big property. This one was almost 4,000 square feet, and it was a five-bedroom, three-bathroom house. The crazy thing was, is this was definitely cosmetic in nature in that we weren't moving walls. We weren't changing structural things with the house. Most of the major systems were actually in really good shape, but it was still a lot of square footage. So it was still a six-figure rehab. I'm going to call this house the fish tank house and the ninja sword house. And that's because I've never seen so many tanks with all different types of reptiles and snakes and fish. I thought we were at like the kids museum or something. Luckily, the sellers, they took all that with them. We would be equipped to handle that, but that would be a new one. I I haven't been able to get uh, lizards adopted. And then there were ninja swords everywhere. So I don't know whether the dude was a ninja or what the deal was, but that was kind of what stuck out to me about this specific property. The other key takeaway is it had solar panels. And I think this would actually be something that I would love for you guys out there in our community to engage with. I've talked myself in and out of multiple times whether there's a benefit to solar panels. And kind of where I've come down on this issue 
is if they are newer solar panels and they're very energy efficient and there's not an insane amount of them, I think it can be seen as a benefit. This particular property, even though the solar panels were totally paid off, we actually didn't see it as a huge benefit and we did not reinstall them because we did need to put a new roof on this particular property. So those were a couple of the key takeaways for this pocket listing that we needed to take into consideration. Okay, so let's talk about the property on 54th Avenue in Green Valley Ranch. Again, it was another pocket listing. It was a relationship with a great real estate agent that we've got a nice relationship with. And this one, I'll try not to get choked up on my own podcast, but these sellers are, are absolute saints. And the kind of the unique scenario there is the reason they didn't want to list the property is they were giving foster care for kiddos um, that had cancer and had serious medical conditions. So from a health standpoint or a health risk standpoint, you can't have a bunch of people doing showings and walking through the property. This was actually the newest property that we ever purchased. It was only built in 2018 and then it didn't need a lot of work. For us, that's obviously a nice thing. I love getting cosmetic properties from time to time. I can actually work off of a little bit thinner of a margin and again, this was a scenario where the sellers had their own real estate agent. They paid that agent a commission. We were happy to not charge a commission on our end and save them some money. We were able to extend the closing twice for them. So flexibility was key because they were actually moving out of state to, I believe, Phoenix. And again, whatever we needed to do to be sensitive, when we inspected the property, we were really careful to take off our shoes wear masks, not really touch anything, bring kind of those Clorox wipes, just really, really be sensitive to what they had going on in their lives. And then we actually put in about $32,000 worth of rehab because we just needed to spruce it up because it was a newer property. I call this one the saint house because these, these sellers are saints and what they're doing for these kids. So we were really excited and, and happy to put value in there. The other cool thing about this one was we work with them through the holidays. And so we wanted to be able to move that closing a few times. Then we finish the property right before Christmas. And so we never list deals over the holidays. So we essentially had a completely finished house, had it for about two and a half weeks, and then we put it on the market in early 2024. So those were some of the main takeaways of that pocket listing. I'm going to chunk up these other three deal sourcing top strategies into a couple different timeframes. Because for me, it's all about what's working at any given point of time. And for us, 2015 through 2017, we were doing a lot more off-market deals. And that was a function of two things. One, it was the marketing that we were doing. And two was I only had one acquisitions manager. So I didn't have a lot of people to write a ton of offers and source things on the market via the MLS. We then got into 2019 and, and 2020, and we were doing about 50% of our deals on market and 50% of our deals off market. And I think that was also a, a function of the staffing that we had. So at that point, we had grown to three acquisitions managers who were also licensed realtors and real estate agents. And so they were able to find deals on the MLS, and then they were able to market directly to sellers and close those deals as well. So for us, that's kind of where that 50-50 split came into effect. 2020 through the first half of 2022 was, we're calling them the crazy COVID years in that every deal became a home run. We also still probably got half of our deals on market and half of our deals off market, but every deal that we underwrote as a double using my baseball analogies became a home run. It wasn't that we were the smartest investors in the room. Everything just sold for above asking. I think our big takeaway is we should have continued to market harder. Not to say we had to flip more properties because everyone became so profitable, but that was the takeaway is, is keep doing your marketing. I think the other thing that we want to talk about are some of these new strategies and some of the corrections that have come from the second half of 2022 throughout the rest of that year when things really did, you know, Denver saw, depending upon the neighborhood, anywhere from a 10 to a 15% drop in values of prices. That is where we single-handedly lost the most money on any deal. We lost over 44 grand on one just regular flip because the market turned on us back when I was in the bond business that was called a whipsaw. So things just change drastically quickly. You just got to roll with the punches and you got to keep marketing through that. Right now we're back in 2024 to we're leaning into off market properties. So we're finding more deals there and we are sourcing more deals there. And so really that's where we're going to get into the meat and the potatoes of the rest of this episode are what are some of these other strategies 
And like we talked about, the number one is really agent relationships because you can kind of blend that off-market thought process with technically working with somebody that can list the property on market. So build relationships with agents, go after those pocket listings. For us, we offer value in that we can partnership flip. And so that is where we're able to fix up the property with our funds. And that agent who brought us a deal, as long as they're an experienced agent, they can list it on the back end. So you've got to create win-win relationships. Network at real estate agent associations. That's another great way for you to meet agents so that you can drive up this piece of your business as large as possible. Again, we talked about relisting. That's something we're very happy to do. We've also had times where the real estate agent has a personal connection with their client. Maybe it's a family member and for family dynamics or maybe friend dynamics or significant other dynamics, they actually don't want to list the property on the back end. So we are happy to have them bring us a deal. They can earn their commission from the seller and we'll actually just pay them a referral fee for thinking of elevation first versus any other real estate investor out there. So just be creative in ways that you can add value to real estate agents. And I guarantee you, you will get deals. Think about it. They are the people that are in everyone else's thoughts and and mind when it comes to selling a house. So the way we always say it is you want to give them another tool to be in their tool belt to help them solve their problems for their sellers. And then they look like rock stars if they don't want to list the property traditionally on the MLS. So again, that is still number one. For us, the number two way is doing cold calling. And you can go about this in two different methods. The first is you can use a independent company or a third party company to make cold calls. So the things you're going to have to consider are you got to spend money to pull the data to find those homeowners. And that content um, has to be scrubbed so that you can find actual contact information for those folks. And then you can get people to do the calling and then you get the warm leads. I I have fellow investors that also are doing that whole process themselves. So they're pulling the list themselves. They're making those calls themselves. They're booking appointments. Um, We see it as a better benefit, in my opinion, and a little more cost effective to use a third party company. You're definitely going to spend a couple thousand dollars a month. But to me, for the amount of volume and the extra um, deal flow that you can get, I think that's significantly worth it. So cold calling is um, is really a good source for us. Um, We have actually paused it right now because we have so many leads that are now kind of coming back to surface and back to life. We'll probably start that back up in the second half of the year. But we have 700 leads that we're still working through over the last three years when we hired cold callers. And on average, that was generating two full-time cold callers, and they were calling from the Philippines. We're yielding about, on slow months, about 30 leads per month. And we had a couple months where we had a lot of really good leads, and we get as high as 45 to 50 leads in a month. And then from that, it really depends upon how good is your person on the phone. So to me, training is key. You really want to train your acquisitions people, or maybe it's a real estate agent working on your behalf of how to properly work that lead add value to them, get down to the bottom of what their problems are, and then make as many offers as possible. So that for number two deal sourcing, that is still something that that we're definitely doing. Let's call it the old gold. You know, you can still kind of go back to that mine and harvest leads. I think it's something that's really important and we're definitely seeing kind of the fruit from our labors. So that's number two. So we're going to take a quick break and tell you about the next Elevation Academy. If you're looking to dive deep into real estate investing, this is definitely the event for you. Our academy features over a hundred step process to help you navigate every single thing from market analysis all the way down to every aspect of project management. So this is tailored for both beginners and seasoned investors. And our one day intensive training will equip you with the strategies and insights needed to elevate your real estate investing game. Spots are definitely limited. So click on the link below in the show notes to sign up and transform your approach to real estate investing. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Okay, so just a quick recap, we talked about our number one deal sourcing method, which is actually working with real estate agents and pocket listings. We talked about cold calling, which is number two. And then the third one that we're going to get into is an on market sourcing method, which is using the MLS. I know it seems basic and simplistic, but obviously those are the properties where people obviously want to sell them. So I'll give you a couple of tips and tricks on how we're finding deals in today's current market environment. And there's two schools of thought. You can go after properties that just hit the market and try to negotiate as aggressively as possible and get those deals under contract. 
Or you can also go after what they call stale listings, meaning listings that have been on the market in our current environment, I'd argue anywhere from 60 days or longer. The average days on market, um, which is how long a property is on the multiple listing service before it goes under contract, right now is right around 40 days. Now that's an average of every price point. So it's super different between sizes, between prices, between locations, but all things being super equal, that's how long it's taking. So if you're looking for properties that have been sitting for two months or more, there's probably a reason. They've probably fallen in and out of contract a few times, and there should be some ability, even if it's priced high, to try to negotiate the prices down. An example, we just did a property for one of our fellow investors in the Sloan's Lake area, and we were actually able to negotiate over a $220,000 discount on a property. So it started in the $900,000 price range, and we got it for the high sixes. And you just know that sometimes things are just overpriced. We then go in and we do an inspection and we look at the roof and the sewer. Sadly, both of those were shot. So were we able to negotiate another healthy discount for our client? So take swings at the plate. You know, you got to take a swing if you're ever going to hit the ball, as they say. We haven't had as much success in the first half of the year chasing new listings because a lot of times you're going to get outbid by other investors. Stick to your numbers, stick to your metrics, don't overpay. There will always be more properties. Right now in Metro Denver, the average amount of inventory is around 4,700 homes right now. So just think about it. There's 4,700 other opportunities, theoretically, that you could go after. The other thing that you wanna look for are keywords. So in the listing descriptions, you can set up searches that talk about things like fixer upper, handyman special, investor special. My favorite one is sweat equity. Normally that is the most destroyed house and somebody thinks, oh, if you just fix it up yourself, you've got sweat equity. But those are key search terms that you can use that will automatically drop properties in your inbox or your real estate agent's inbox that you're working with. And they should be deals that need a lot of work and there should be margin for you to flip those properties. So take a look at those. Build rapport with listing agents. That's really important. And something that we'll do is we've got a couple agents on our team that are really good at this. And it's about picking up the phone, having conversations. I know a lot of people in today's environment love the non-personal contact. They like to use text. They like to use emails. I get that from a negotiation standpoint. The more you can learn from somebody on the phone, the more that you can figure out what's the root cause of their problems and help solve those problems versus don't just always text. I think I would really look at giving somebody a verbal idea of where you would wanna come in and then you don't waste your time or their time. So we just did a property in the University Hills part of Denver, which is a great kind of hot market for us to do flips in. It's very desirable. It's a great location. There was a property that the listing price was pretty dang low. So even though we knew we could offer about $20,000 over listing, it was probably gonna have a lot of activity. And by the time we called, and maybe it had only been on the market for a day, they already had something crazy like 10 offers already. And we knew we weren't going to be able to pay that price. Just find that out from the agent. Don't submit another offer that they actually have to. It's really, they have a fiduciary responsibility to present every offer to their client via their code of ethics for their real estate license. Don't put more work on their plate when you're $50,000 below what they could get from somebody else. Just stay in good contact with them. If something falls out, you want to be in touch with them versus if we're close or obviously if they don't have any offers, you need to submit an offer. You can't buy a property without submitting an offer when it's on the MLS. So those are some tips and tricks. The other thing is keep track of your key metrics, which is how many deals do you have to analyze? How many deals are you writing an offer on? How many are you going under contract on and then actually closing? So there's a lot of similarities that happen between different points of the year. Normally the first half of the year, first and second quarter, again, we're, we're doing a lot more off marketing, marketing avenues because there's so much competition in the MLS. And then in the second half of the year, in the third and the fourth quarter, a lot of people have already made their moves. The traditional buying season is, is kind of coming to a close. It's the holidays. We do a lot more on market deals. So track your numbers. And if you're not getting the deal flow that you want, you're probably going to have to search for more properties, write more offers get better at closing deals or negotiating prices, but the MLS is, is still a gold mine for building your real estate portfolio and your fix and flip portfolio.
Let's talk about number four, and that's digital marketing. And I think that there's a couple different buckets that we could really go down several rabbit holes, but I want to keep it to three specific areas. The first one is paid advertising. So obviously you can create paid ads. You can reach out directly to sellers or real estate agents or people in the real estate community. You can do ads on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, you could obviously do traditional marketing. You could do TV. You could do advertising. You could do, you know, billboards. Um, paid ads are good. They're obviously expensive and you have to be consistent. So my personal opinion is if you don't have a big budget, um, doing the traditional media is probably not the right fit. We do a little bit of paid advertising, but we're not experts in that right now. It's something that I like to personally get into because I think we can have great success but we're already having kind of other success without spending those big dollars. And I think we're going to keep kind of mining, you know, those mining for gold in that manner, if you will. But you can definitely do paid, keep it consistent. The other big takeaway is you have to have lightning speed follow-up. If you've paid to reach out to somebody and they've gotten back to you and said, yes, I'm open to a conversation about selling my property, you have to get back to them or else they're going to immediately start calling more people. So if you're doing SEO and somebody's searching on the internet, you know, sell my house fast for cash in Denver or just sell my house fast. If they don't if you don't get to them typically within the first hour, they're going to go on to somebody who does get to them. But with that said, keep following up cuz sometimes even if somebody gets back to them first, but you're the one that keeps calling and providing value and solutions, you're going to win some business. The second area is ways that we obviously lean into, and that's what I'm doing, talking to you now, and that's creating content. So whether it's content that you can use to help validate yourself as an investor, being an expert over other competitors when sellers are looking to offload their properties, hopefully us having a podcast, showing our level of expertise, showing we've got a great team, that's going to hopefully help us win deals. And it's also building our community. So other real estate agents are reaching out to us, other investors. Obviously, this podcast is a sweet spot. We do a lot on Instagram. We do Facebook. We're really getting to do some great traction on YouTube using shorts. There's just a lot of different ways. Even LinkedIn has been a great uh, opportunity for us digitally. So again, you kind of have the paid, you have the content. And something that we are absolutely scratching the surface on, I think not only as a community in the investment world, but just overall is the use of AI. We're not at the forefront ourselves, but we're trying to learn as much as humanly possible about how to integrate AI into what we're doing to make more content, to make response times faster, to analyze deals better. So there's always a human touch in what we're doing. And I think that's why we'll never be replaced in this business, but to scale up and to be successful, absolutely leaning back on the tools that AI can provide to you is 100% gonna be key. That kind of rounds out digital marketing. Let's go on to the fifth. In 2024, the number five top strategy for us of how we're sourcing great deals is building community. And I'm sure people listening or maybe watching this are thinking, well, what the hell does that mean? For us, it's really actually going back to grassroots and back to basics. So I'm going to date myself here, but definitely when I started in the workforce in the early 2000s, it was really kind of, as they say, belly to belly type business. I worked in corporate marketing, I worked in sales, and it was really getting out and pounding the pavement and meeting with a lot of people directly. Now, I think the cool thing about that is, is you can use all these different tools and technology and community building to just foster a much larger community a more involved community and something that you can give back to on a regular basis. So attending networking events, meetups are great. Meetup is a platform that you can search any specific niche that you're interested in and involved in. And there will probably be 10 to 20 different types of groups that you can get involved in. So definitely go down that road. In the Metro Denver area, we actually have our own meetups. So we've got two. We've got the Elevation Investment Properties meetup that's all about what we're talking about right now. We do another cool one called Fix and Flip Live. And so that's a meetup where we take people through our existing flips and show people huge million dollar properties that we're working on and small condos that we're working on and everything in between. And then the Broadway Collective also has its own meetup too. So it's all about just finding your community be consistent. Also, in my opinion, provide value to other people. Don't meet somebody at a networking event and then immediately think, how can I get business from them? Sometimes I can almost see it in somebody's eyes where you know they just want you to stop talking so they can immediately just interrupt you. Some people, they call them vampires, meaning somebody is just sucking the life out of you 
Be the opposite. Be the person that adds life into somebody else and value into somebody else. So do networking events, do meetups, do kind of old school pound the pavement type of marketing. Another way you can do that is through conferences. Not only do you learn a ton, but make it a specific action item to ideally before you attend those conferences, make connections and reach out to people in advance, try to book meetings in advance. And then, uh, you know, kind of a cheesy little thing that I always do when I go to conferences, sit in different spots every single break. So if you're meeting new people at each individual break, take down their information, take a picture with them. I think that's something that's really important. So you can help remind them of who the hell you are in the future. Again, add value to them as the number one point and you will definitely get business from it. The other kind of marketing communities that we try to foster are, it's right now called actually the older adult segment. I think a lot of people called it the senior citizen segment. And that is a great community that takes a long time to gain people's trust. But if you can add value to that segment, it's where we get a lot of business from. And it's something that I really enjoy. I think some people are not willing to go sit in grandma and grandpa's living rooms and find out all the myriad of things they've got going on in their life and their family life. But that's a community you can really build a lot of relationships with, and it's going to pay off dividends for a long, long time to come. Another one that we're really not that great at, but it's something that I think is an area of opportunity for us to grow and, and you guys can kind of take it and run with it would be the legal community. So whether people unfortunately are going through divorces, if there's death involved, meaning there's estate issues, probate issues, trusts. Those are people that need solutions and you are going to be able to provide those if you're a creative problem solver. So get involved in those communities, attend those meetups, attend those association meetings. I think that's another big one. And then the last one is the financial industry. So if you think about it, people that are CPAs, tax attorneys, wealth managers, financial advisors, they are in the, the circle of trust, if you will, with most families. And if somebody's got a house to sell or a rental property, or they're doing a move up themselves or moving out of state, if you're in those communities and building value there, I guarantee you, you're going to get business out of it. So that's number five. Again, these are not super secret issues um, or super secret strategies, I should say. Really, the issue is being consistent, picking maybe one or two of these, going deep and committing for as long as you can. So I think that's super, super important. So kind of as we wind down this episode, um, we've got those top five different marketing strategies and ways that we are delivering value to people. So whether it's building relationships with agents, whether it is sourcing on the MLS, whether it's cold calling, doing digital marketing or community marketing, those are going to really help drive you to succeed in 2024. And again, add value, be a creative problem solver. It's not always just about price. I would honestly say price is probably typically the third most important aspect to a seller in a distressed or non-traditional selling manner. So help solve those problems. I'm also a really big proponent of being a lifetime learner. So read as much as you can, attend those conferences, find out what's new and going on. Cause that's not to say that you don't come across some great thing that AI can help you source deals that we don't know about. You should be, you know, learning as much as you can. So continue to be that lifelong learner. And then it's all about collaboration. As we're really winding down on this episode, we talked about being a lifetime learner. To me, collaboration is key. So we had the episode prior to this one with another great investor. His name is Anson Young. And on paper, he is 100% competitor to us. He does flips. He does wholesaling. He is a real estate agent. He has a team. He invests out of state. He produces great content. But that's why I wanted that dude on this show, because we can collaborate, we can come up with great ideas, we can buy and sell between one another. So collaborate in all the different five top strategies that I just went over, and I guarantee you, you will win this year and you will win every year in the future. So collaboration is key. As I mentioned, we've got some great meetups, so check out the show notes. We'd love to build our community so that we can help everybody grow together. Come to our Elevation Academy. That's another area where we can add a lot of value. And then stay tuned, or I always like to use this term because obviously we put those signs at the top of our listings of coming soon, a deeper dive for masterminds. It's something that I kind of nerd out on myself from not only my educational background and teaching background, but how can we build a, a deeper, more intimate community for people that are really on the same level? So keep an eye out for that. Find ways that you can add value to all these different buckets. 
So as we wrapped up this episode, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Hit those five different buckets. I guarantee you, you're going to win in 2024, 2025, and long into the future. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Raising the Flipping Bar. If you found value in our insights and stories, let's keep the conversation going. Connect with me on social media, and be sure to share this episode with friends or colleagues who might benefit. Your feedback and reviews help us grow and reach more listeners like you. So please, if you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. Thanks again to the Elevation Academy for sponsoring today's show. If you're interested in learning more, click the link in the show notes below. And remember, every property tells a story. Every deal brings a lesson. Keep reaching for those goals and we'll catch you on the flip side.